You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we have on another hammer. You know, I don't want to just talk about the bodies of water, but I also want to talk about just anglers, local and regional sticks uh, that really make up this really cool area of the, of the country. And today we have Tyler Trent on. Uh, Tyler, uh, based on just your MLF stats alone, over $100,000 in winnings, four career wins, top tens, and then All-American, dude, you, you really represented extremely well there. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. No, absolutely. Uh, thanks for coming on. Like, what what got you started in the sport? Um, well, my parents, well, my dad, he's always fished, but he he was never for like hardcore tournament angler, and we'd go out like mess around in the evening, like crappy fishing or bass fishing and whatnot. And we eventually got to the stage where we get into a couple of club tournaments, and I just got ate up with the competition part of it. Did you fish high school as well and then progress to college? Uh, I fished through high school, but like I was never on any fishing teams or anything like that. I just always fished whatever it was to fish like with the big guys and got my tail whooped a lot. <laughs> when did you make the transition or how'd that work from your high school years, your college years into where you are now? Did you fish college? No, I didn't fish any like college. I went just to community college and, um, I just fished like any open tournament I could get in or like federation oh, wow. type stuff. And just from there on, I just, that's how I've ever done. I didn't really, I, I'd have liked to go through the college route because I feel like it, in today's world it gets you a lot more exposure versus winning just everything around the house. It, isn't that weird though, that that's, that, I think that's correct. Like it's almost about the exposure versus the wins. And yep. I think that's so weird where we're at now because and clearly your resume and so many local anglers, I mean, you see them pull up at the boat ramp and you might as well just give them the money and just go home. But yep. yet you don't know who they are. And it, it is such a weird thing now with social media where there's that balance between your skill set on the water and then your, your, I don't know what your business savvy off the water, I guess is what you call it. It's weird. I just, like I said, I just wish I would, if I could go back and do it over, I'd try the college route probably just for the exposure part. I think that really helped like sponsor wise. With, with that said, with the exposure wise, like wh what area of the country, just for the people that are listening that don't know who you are, wh wh what part of the country do you really call home? Um, Mainly Bugs Island. And I fish Smith Mountain quite a bit, but I, pre I like to stay on Bugs Island just because it has a lot more bigger tournaments. And I'll fish Falls and Jordan Lake in North Carolina with my buddy, uh, Josh Hook. Kerr. That is one that's come up a ton of times. I've interviewed some guys from the Department of Wildlife Resources for Virginia about that place. And I remember stories of always slipping in the bushes and catching massive weights a thousand years ago, it feels like. And then the professionals come here and they don't crack 20. There was a big, there was a fish virus there. Like what is in your mind, what's the history of Kerr Lake? Cause it's such a weird place. It really is. It's like one of the hardest places to be consistent because, I mean, one thing you deal with the lake level up and down all the time. And uh, like, I mean, it just, it really just gets beat up by big tournaments. I mean, like most lakes like Smith Mountain, it'll get hit with an Angler's Choice, a hundred and some boat tournament or BFL here and there. But it's almost every weekend it bugs in the spring. And that I know that it don't help it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean that place gets hammered. But I guess what's interesting is you look at places like a Gunnersville or a Potomac River, a James that, that I would say get the snot pounded out of it twenty four seven, and they still produce. And with Kerr, it's not that way. And I guess like, is it because of is there a fish population issue? I mean, what do you think the problem is there, or what could be done to help that? I'm not sure about what could be done to help it, but I just it doesn't have that great of a population of big fish for sure. Like if you catch a four pounder, you're living right. I mean, mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, it's eat up with like, cause I weigh a lot of fish when I catch and it's eat up with like 140 to two twenties. Like you, two, it, it, two yeah. and a half and above is when you can like, okay, I'm making a little ground now. I, uh, I interviewed, uh, Travis, uh, Donaldson. Um, I don't know if you know, Travis, and, and we talked about that occur about like those unicorns, which is anything over four pounds there, which is it's absolutely, but it's crazy when I think it was, he got a second place at high rock, 
and you could fit high rock into nutbush and that place somehow has more bigger fish than Kerr. And it, it, that is, like you said, it's so fascinating. That that place quality, but it doesn't have a quantity. To me, it's a lot more dead water at High Rock. Like at Bugs Island, you can get bit anywhere. But to find the good ones is a problem. High Rock, you can fish a lot of dead water. But like if you catch one, it might be probably three pounds. And then plus with those low bridges, man, if you have high water event, man, that kills out Marshy and, and Advocate Creek too. And that place would yep. be even smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the Abbey Creek's huge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you know, back back to Kerr Reservoir um, as your main as your main stomping grounds. What have you seen just change wise over the years? Just observations when it comes to forage or just cover and things. I'd say probably one of the biggest things is like like a lot of the old school guys, like especially the Carolina guys. They used to be known as like offshore structure fishermen and stuff, like big time crankers and and whatnot and like over like what just what i've been fishing is like they don't hold the structure anymore not good like offshore structure they like to suspend and chase the blueback heron around and that's one reason they quit holding the structure was the blueback heron they roam a lot which i like it because those guys thankfully don't catch them as good as they used to and the a suspended fish is like hard to stay on but if you can catch them like you're hard to beat most of the time like the david Wrights of the world people like that that just absolutely print, print <laughs> checks on that place absolutely david Wright. he's a, he's actually a good buddy of mine and he's he was he's still he'll still show up and kick your tail every now and then <laughs> Dude, it shows you the longevity in this sport, honestly, compared to let's say football, where you're probably right. done by your mid twenties. But I mean, look at Rick Clun. You can you can be in your prime well into your forties and fifties, which is really cool. Yeah, that's a fact. So so with with Kerr, I want to segue really to your your newest tournament that you did, which is at Hartwell. Is Hartwell at all? And just kind of like I like to go through like when I do these interviews, like more of the mental side and the blow by blow. Uh, I mean, if for my listeners, if you live in a vacuum, Hartwell, Spotted Bass Central, down near Clemson, super clear, deep water. Kerr, there, I guess there are some portions of Kerr that are kind of that way that translate. Like, was that an easy tournament for you to prep for? Or was that like kind of on Mars? Oh, no, it was pretty easy because for one, it's like offshore. Well, that's why I planned on fishing and that's how I like to fish. And they are similar, like almost in the layout. But they don't fish the same, in my opinion, because of the spotted bass and the fish just like they set up different because even though Bugs is known as like a blueback heron lake, it's not as they don't, the fish do not like relate and rely on the blueback heron as much as they do at like Hartwell or Murray or where, mm. you know, the, like a true blueback lake. Yeah, yeah. Not, not yet anyways, knock on wood. But yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. So then what was your plan then going into that event? Was um, your plan then to work on the lower part of the lake and just target spots, or was it just to look for largemouth? No, uh, well, the lower part of the lake for sure, like from Green Pond down, because we actually went all the way out of Clemson. So they made a little bit of well, like a 15, 20-minute <laughs> run just to get to like the mouth of the lake at Green Pond, and then it was probably another 15 or 20 minutes to the dam. But I, I mean – in practice, I just idle and mark as many places as possible. Well, this place is just holding fish or cane piles, brush piles, anything. And that's just like, that's how I fish. I don't have to make a cast. You know, you know, some people, for as soon as they go to practice, first thing they do is drop the troll motor and start casting. I don't even want to, I want to like at least ride for a couple of hours and just mark some stuff. Then I might go check it. That's actually a good strategy versus mark take a few casts, Mark, take a few casts, just bang right. out a couple of places to begin with. That's, right. that's actually, yeah. Hmm. That's a good idea, actually. Wow. So going into practice, like how did you feel like after, you know, day one, day two of practice, were you feeling pretty comfortable with what you found? Like where were you mentally? Oh yeah. I felt good about it, but like it, the guy, the top three guys that ended up finishing first, second and third, like people knew they was going to probably do that because all of them, had experience on Lanier and which sets up supposedly like that. And they just kind of understand it a little better than the average person. And I mean, I felt good about it, but I didn't think, you know, I thought I could catch 15 or so every day where they was catching, you know, 
anywhere from 17 to 20 pretty much. I mean, I felt good about it, but I won't like overconfident by no means. Is brush pile fit? Because I've always wanted to figure out what gave you the best home field advantage. And some people would say like tidal water, but where would brush pile cane pole fishing stack? Because I feel like that's a pattern when they're on that being a local where you have 6,000 waypoints. That's got to be, that's got to be a strong home field advantage. Well, it's having the spots and, and like knowing when to leave them and when not, you know, because it's pretty much once you, those fish are so pressured, once you catch one, even if it's 30 with it, you might as well crank up and leave. Oh, shit. Let them give them, give them time to set back up. And then you rotate them. Cause I mean, in practice, I idle for basically two days straight, probably close to 14 hours a day. So I had damn 18, roughly 1800 waypoints. So holy God, <laughs> learning which ones had the better fish, dude. How the hell do you go through 1800 waypoints without, I don't know, like cocaine or Adderall or something? That just seems insane. <laughs> That's just the way I like to fish. Like, I fish offshore like a shallow person kind of does. Like, I mean, I pull up, make three, four casts, pull the trolling motor, and hit the next spot. Do the same thing. I'll, like, at the end of the day, you can fill it. <laughs> Whew, that's brilliant. That's actually really brilliant. Okay. Yeah. You don't waste any time then. Is, is that kind of mm -hmm. like the. Is that just a style that you grew up doing or is that specifically just for Hartwell? Um, it it kind of works around here, but it works better like that because at Hartwell and Mary and stuff. Because last last year was the first year I went to Mary and I happened to win the regional down there. That's how I made it to Hartwell. And that lake set up a lot better for me because it's no spots. It's like just all largemouth. So that just kind of helped me. I don't know. I feel like that just made it easier on me versus having to kind of learn and deal with the spots you know, like at Hardwell. Murray is awesome. Murray is really cool. I went there for the college championship in 2015, I think it was. And it, it is, if you're not used to the blueback thing, holy shit, it's different. It is yeah. really different. hundred percent. Now going, so then going into Hartwell day one, like just kind of, you know, walk us through your day. What, what ended up happening? So the first cast, I called a two and a half and I, and I put him in a whale next cast two and a half next cast two and a half next cast two and a half and then it just kind of slowed down and i told my co-angler i was like go on and get your stuff ready we're gonna leave i said i'm gonna make one more cast though and i threw back out and i had on like a six uh, easy six pounder and she jumped like five or six times and i was like oh this is good i was like it's no way i'm gonna lose it after all that and she pulled off right at the boat and oh my god <laughs> and to be honest with you i handle like bad situations pretty well well that one kind of mentally broke me just for the fact it was at that tournament for that much money and it was my first stop so i had to like try to keep that out of my mind for the whole rest of the day mm, dude that is brutal uh how did you what did you do immediately after that fish because like i i've interviewed enough people it feels like the people that do well they have that one moment of the day where shit hits the fan right but they're able to overcome it so yeah, uh, what was going I through made, your head? I was sick, obviously, but I made like three more casts. I pulled it up. I said, well, I said, wait, cancel that one. Let's go look for the next one. That's what you got to do. I mean, that, that that's and what I you got to do. Continue just to run, hop place to place to place. And, and at this point, how much weight do you got? Would you say you broke up real oh, just a second? Yeah, I, I broke up after you, 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 uh, you pulled off the six pounder next to the boat and you're going through just what your next move was going to be. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just continued to hop place after place and was like fortunate to scrape up 14 something. And I lost several more throughout the day because I was, I mean, what I was fishing, you, they either get them or you lose them. I mean, I was burning, like burning a fluke. And then I could scrape up some on a drop shot on some of the places where they wouldn't commit them. And then, so at the end of the day one, how much weight did you have? Four, a little over 14. I was in 14. sixth place. I, I, literally, I literally sit in sixth place the whole tournament. I was in six after the second day and six after it was all over. <laughs> that's, that's impressive. That's really impressive. Cause again, you got 14 pounds, 13 and then 11. Yeah. So then going into day two, what, where was your head at? What adjustments were you thinking about making? Or are you just going to do the exact same thing? 
I won't go make any. I was just going to hit as many places as possible. And like, obviously in the back of my head, I remember which places had better fish or seemed to have better fish. And I would circle back through them twice as I was running new places. Like if I went past. No, because yeah, that is interesting because it's like when you have that many spots, I feel like as a human, I would want to go back to the day before where I caught the six pounder first, where I had that success. Or is it where you got to be like, no, I just got to run new water first. Like, where's your head at with that? I'm basically just running new water. Just like I kind of erased the first day. But, you know, if my second day isn't going like I planned, then I will start running like the spots I hit the day before. But Uh I'm just like truly when I have that many places, I haven't even had the chance to check all of them. So I was like checking places as the tournament was going on as well and hitting some of the places that I knew was good. And I, if, I think that I think that was one of the killers, like, versus me hanging with the, like, especially the three locals. They knew which ones were good. And didn't have to waste time. Yeah, because, like, I mean, that makes sense. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, no, like, I mean, that makes sense. Like, with the locals, there is definitely an advantage there that, that you have to overcome. But w- w- with this strategy, which is a strategy that works a lot on blueback lakes, were you specifically just throwing a moving bait and then going on to the next one? I mean, or w- is it when you saw something with forward facing sonar, then you'd go to something like a drop shot or something to drop on top of them? Because that was the best way to, and then I would switch to a drop. I'd, I'd literally pull up, make like two casts with a uh, reaction bait and then like two casts with a drop shot and I was gone. It don't mm. matter if like, it, I don't like, even if it was 50 fish there, and you could see them, like, if they didn't bite and pour chaos, I was gone. Wow. That's discipline. I could not, yeah. That's something I think we could all get really better, really good with. So then, you know, day day two ends, you got 13 pounds. We're going into the, we're going into the final day here. How many spots after these first two days just spitball? How many spots do you think you ran? I mean, it's, it's truly hard to say because it always seems like it's more than it is, but I mean, I wouldn't be scared to say I was hitting at least 80 a day. I mean, Jesus. But, and that's probably like the bare minimum because, I mean, I would let some places I'd make two casts at least. That's insane, dude. I don't know. The, the confidence you have to have to fish that form. I mean, there, there are guys I know that, and a lot of them are river rats are like, I can't, I can't run. I want to sit in an area because that's how they're, they grew up fishing. And so this style is just, is completely alien to so many people, but damn it, like, these places, man, it feels like you have to do that to have success. Right. So now going into the last day, was it just more of the same thing? Just running new water? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Hit previously. But I mean, like your weight, my weights went down each day, but it wasn't because I didn't have a bite. I just simply didn't land them. If I'd have landed roughly everything I the bit that or I had on, you know, I probably would have finished maybe third. I still wouldn't have beat the guys that was first and second for sure. I mean, still, if you look at it, though, that's good enough for $14,000 and a sixth place finish, which, again, when you look at some of these people that were in the top, you know, above you, man, those are just some heavy hitters, absolute heavy hitters. And, and then you go from there, and then there was also another big tournament that you had. I mean, just to, this is this year has been awesome for you. You had a cat event that I think you had that event while I was initially trying to get a hold of you to, to have you on the show. Um, yeah. and for, the pe- for the people that don't know, what is the cat event? series what is that um it's like a trail ran in virginia north carolina and south carolina and it doesn't matter if you fish a 30 boat cat or a 200 boat cat if you win one you can beat the best of the best like in that area so anytime you win a cat be proud of it <laughs> what was this your was this your first time winning this cat no i want this it was actually my second time. Me and my, my dad normally fishes with me a lot. Me and him won oh, that's it cool. um, in 2020. And then in 2020, second. And then 2022, we, I don't know, we finished maybe 20th or something. And then we happened to win it again this year. Me and my buddy Josh. With the way that tournament fell and the, the, the pressure with the Bass Masters, how much did that affect the fishing for you? Um, it probably honest like anytime that leg gets beat up and we have a tournament coming, like it 
usually helps me a lot because I like to fish like a lot deeper than most on that lake. And to, I mean, honestly, it was smooth sailing for us. Like hmm. we, we lost one big fish that would have helped, but like luckily it didn't cost us. So it didn't really matter. That's interesting. Cause yeah, first I always think when you're dealing with a, a 200 plus boat, like the bass open or the bass open series and the practice and everything, a lot of times it does mess people up, especially when you have all well, them running around the lake and everything. Right. Were you shocked at all with how that went down? The bass open? Um, yeah, I was actually surprised. Like some of the guys still caught them as good as they did. Like as bad as the conditions were, you know, the lake came up, I think three foot or so. And I mean, that first day was brutal from the winds and they, they still managed to do fairly well. Which, I mean, I think the lower part of the top 10 was kind of average for bugs, but the first couple places was pretty impressive. I hate just tinfoil hat theory. How the hell is it the week that they show up is when the water's going to get into the bushes? That is such a... <laughs> like, that lake's got a mind of its own. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, if, if you told me they paid them to raise that water level, I'd probably believe you because like the odds <laughs> of it happening so perfectly like that, just so they could talk about like, oh, the fish were in the bushes like when Biffle did it. And it's like, that, that sucker hasn't been in the bushes for God knows how long until you guys showed up. <laughs> Yeah, if I'd have been fishing it, I'd have cried if the lake had came up that much because I like to fish offshore, and that ruins that bite most of the time. It, it, the lake has adjusted so much recently, though, with the blueback coming into it, where I remember growing up and people told me about the bushes and the cranking, but the blueback really have completely adjusted that place and, and are, are, are pretty much... When you go down to Lake Murray and the Hartwells and stuff, are a lot of those tactics basically the same thing that you're implementing, generally speaking, on Kerr? Not really. It's like, I'm, I don't know, it's hard to, like, the techniques that work on the Aaron Lakes don't work at bugs. Like, they, like you can go down, at, like, in the fall, you can kind of catch them on that deal with, like, a top water kind of, like, at uh, Hartwell and Murray, but I don't know, they still... They just don't set up the same. It's it's so hard to explain. So they're they're following the herring, but they're not true herring eaters yet. Right. They are. I mean, they're they're eating them, but like as far as the techniques to catch them are totally different than at Hartwell and Mary. If if you're not them fish at Hartwell and Mary, look up twenty four seven once they get mm -hmm. off the bank. Like when they first get off down there, you can like I could get them to chase a drop shot or something to the bottom but man like when we was actually fishing the tournament like if, if you won't throw something up above them they probably won't go hit it <laughs> that is interesting that is really weird that they act so differently with the bait in there yeah probably probably is also water clarity too honestly because that place fluctuates so much compared to a murray or a hartwell it does that's the thing too i think about that like I'm going to actually, I'm in talks right now to get the Army Corps of Engineers on the show to talk to them about Kerr. Because I really think like if you had that water be stable and you didn't have these wild fluctuations, I think it would change that like completely and really make it just go off. I, I believe it would too. The, I mean, it's nice for the lake to come up, you know, and give like, especially in the springtime during the spawn to give like a fry with not a place to hide. But honestly, like, to me, it fishes better if it's just a hair below 300. Yeah, and not bouncing back and forth in these massive right. swings and stuff. Yeah, because I think that would help with the spawning class too. But honestly, I think what that place needs is to be stocked, like a nice supplemental stock of F1s to counteract the, I guess, Alabama bass or spotted bass that are in there. Yeah, they've gotten in there pretty bad, at least in certain areas. Are you catching any size to them, or are they just the rats that everyone is catching? It's mostly rats, but I have caught, I think I've caught four or five now with three pounds. Okay. But it's, it's still a lot of, like, those 12-inch ones pretty much. It, it's weird because, like, I've caught, I've caught them down. I've caught spots at Lake Kiwi, Lake Hartwell, and I've caught, like, three or four years ago, I caught one at, at Kerr. And it's like, those fish are different. They're just built mm -hmm. different. And I don't know why. They, they, they're the meanest fighting fish you can catch too, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you, got a striper. 
Oh, dude. Yeah. You catch a three to four pound one of those things, especially if you're using a drop shot or, or, or something like that. It'll just, mm-hmm. it'll rip drag for it from you. Yeah. So what, what else do you have on your schedule this year? Um, I'm on, I'm probably hopping to like one or two BFLs maybe towards the end of the year, especially the two that they got on bugs in September. And then I'll have it. It's a two day team tournament, English choice team tournament. That's, that'll pay 25,000. That'll be in October and that's in Bugs Island. So I'm definitely not going to miss that. And I think other than them too, I'm just going to hop into anything I can get in. Like I don't truly have anything like scheduled. What lake do you hate the most that's in the area that you would rather throw yourself in the ocean than fish? Uh, to be honest, I mean, I don't hate any of them. Like I just, the, the biggest thing with me is like drive. I hate driving. <laughs> so you'd be fine with fishing turn on tidal water then? So that's what my main reason. Oh no. I would, yeah, I'll, I'll say to James and in Potomac, <laughs> if I hate two places. <laughs> they don't have deep enough water for me. <laughs> oh, but, I mean, that, but that's like, it, so. If you're, is your thoughts about taking this to the next level, and what would that be in a perfect world? Would it be fishing the Bassmaster Opens or like the Costa Series or something like that? Um, yeah, the the Toyota Series. I'm, I might, but I was honestly, I might. If everything works out like I got planned, I might fish the uh, MPFL next year. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Dude, well, that's freaking least, awesome. Because they're going to open like the application thing up, I think, pretty soon. And I'm going to try my luck in that. If I get in, I'm probably going to do it. <laughs> well, where did, Have they announced their schedule yet for next year? They have not. They will, I think that will come at the end of summer, I believe, or fall. Because they usually wait, which they do it right by waiting for everyone else to do their scheduling. Because that's just that's the dumbest thing ever, where they do not organize that shit to where you can fish I, multiple things. I know it's retarded. It really it, is. It is. You look at the Cox and the Pochets and stuff. The guys that just want to fish to make a living at it and not have to do the whole sponsor thing necessarily, and that's yeah. what you got to do. And that's the thing. I was really hoping they could put the schedule out ahead of time of like the application process to get in it because i'm also the type of person i hate to miss any big thing around the house (laughs) i know my chances are better (laughs) Do, do you ever get worried and you hear this a lot at the higher levels about the home field curse where you can know too much about a body of water and it hurts you but it, 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 for you it doesn't seem to be that way is there a way that you don't fish histories to where let me rephrase it History doesn't seem to bother you. Why is that? That history doesn't hurt you? Um, because like, I just, I'm, I'm, I've gotten really good at the forward facing thing. So that just, that like, that helps my whole process because, you know, some people get stuck on like history and the combination of using that because some people, if they see fish, they can't leave. Well, I live by the price, like thought process. If he don't bite in two casts, I ain't worried about him. I'll find another one that is biting. And I fish like that everywhere I go. It's been one thing that's always helped me. Like, I don't care if it's 100 fish on the screen. If they ain't bitten three casts, I I don't really have any use for them. (laughs) How long have you had four fishing sonar? Um, I got it at at the end of 2020. I was a little okay, late getting so, it. Yeah, I got my ass kicked for a long time before I decided to finally <laughs> spend the money and get the damn thing, <laughs> which probably was was an issue. Uh, it's just another tool. I mean, granted, it's it's, it's holy shit. <laughs> I mean, it's oh, a yeah. lot of information. It, it's a it's a huge tool, but you know, like some of the guys you know, always like you know, I mean, they some of them act like it catches the fish and puts them in the boat for you, but it don't exactly do. No. Do all that. <laughs> no, it, it it doesn't. And I think the fish are getting smaller. I have a I have Billy Coles on from Smith Mountain Lake a lot, and we talk about how it seems like the fish in some places starting to shy away when you put when right. you point it at them. And it's like, well, if that's happening now, what in two years, three years? Like, how well, are we gonna have to use worse. this? Oh my God! Yeah, it's gonna be way worse. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've seen it at Smith Mountain as well. Like. When I see one, 
I just like process where he was at and make the cast. And like, as soon as I seen, I turn off of him. I don't want to keep pointing at him just because like you don't want the beam to keep ba- bouncing off of him. Cause they'll definitely move. A lot of times they'll go straight to the bottom. It's just so weird that they're more intelligent than we think. We, we, we really don't give deer and fish enough intelligence for their ability to n- be aware of us. And even when you think of forward facing sonar, it's not been here very long and they're already right. being like, Hey, this is a problem. We, we got to avoid it. They, they, the fish probably wonder why they used to swim, swim so much and not see anything. Now everything just falls right on their head. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden it just like pops right there or they're going to start yeah. glowing here with, with the Garmin and Lawrence 7.8. <laughs> they're going to just start being nuclear powered. <laughs> Then how is your shallow game then? If if you have to, like, especially if you look like at a high rock at certain times of the year where it's just, it's all dock skipping and stuff. Is that something that you, you do are willing to compete with in that area? Or are you just going to force the offshore bite? Oh, I'll, I'll force the offshore bite, but I don't mind going. Like I grew up fishing shallow and then made the transition to fishing offshore. So, I mean, I was good at it. I just don't prefer it. I mean, Fishing offshore has definitely made me a pile more money than fishing up shallow has. But hey, I'll, even now, when I fish offshore, I'll mix in. Like, don't think I won't run to a brim bed or something. <laughs> I was shocked I, the brim brim beds played so big at Hartwell, and then um, I had I had a, oh god, what was I, I interviewed to me. Brian Leclerc who finished oh shit yeah he finished just below you. <laughs> Uh, he won the Bass Nation uh, on the Potomac, and it was a brim bed pattern he found. And that stuff's not talked about as much as I think. You're always told in Bass Masters about the shad. Mm. Never do they really talk about brim bed patterns. Which, which the, t- the top three at Hartwell, they was all herring fish. Them got them because they was hopping places down the lake where I was, and everybody was just. And that was one of the killers too. Was like keeping your eyes open for your competition because like if I seen one guy coming from this direction and then back of my head, I'm like, like, well, which pile has he, mm-hmm. you know, cause you want to try to hit a fresh pile where they don't like set back up versus one that, that they like them. You know, when you make a cast and he don't bite, if it's 15 fish where well, you don't pull them to the boat. So they have to like set back up. When, when I fish, like, when I fish blueback lakes in college, that was bef- that was the year uh, before panoptics became a thing. I think if, if my brain's right, and so you would just have to, like you said, two or three casts and you'd move. But with your Lawrence now, do you even cast depending if if they're not set up the way you want it? Do you just leave? No, I literally drive the trolling motor, look around. If I don't see what I want to see, I don't even cast. I just pull it back up and go to the next one. Yeah, that's huge time saver than when it was before. That's the, other thing, that's the other thing, too, about forward-facing sonar is I think, you know, again, I think every show has people that bash it and, and say that stuff in the comment section. But it's not just about watching them, you know, eat your bait. It's just, is there bait in the area? Are they even here? Are they right. underneath these docks? It's just so many things besides just watch fish eat bait. 100%. And that's now, just like, as it's, it's, it's far as the deal, like, down there, just... It's just nice knowing you hitting what you cast in that, like versus when you pulled up to a waypoint or a top water and you knew it was a like cane pile or brush pile, you didn't have to fan cast. You can throw it straight over top at the first time. And if he bites, he bites. If he don't go to the next one. And I think that's the common theme with, with so many of these lakes that, that people need to get comfortable with is, is speed. And I remember Brian Thrift talking about that at, I think it was a Bash University thing he did a long time ago about just your speed and hitting as many spots as possible and how most people aren't comfortable with it. But the guys that are like you, you get rewarded for it. You really do. I think like the way I look at it, would you roll a cast at 10 fish and hope five of them bite? Or you roll a cast at a hundred of them and hope five of them bite? And that's why like, I try to just increase my, that's why as many places you can hit, the more opportunity you have. What do you think about the smallmouth stuff on the schedule that'll, that'll most likely be there next year for you? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I've been to Erie once, and I oh, loved really? every second. Yeah, I loved every second of it. So I, 
and that was before forward facing sonar so i love to go back anywhere up north dude that's gonna be you're gonna have a, a lot of fun with that especially if you ever get on the saint lawrence or like yeah, places like that yeah. dude it's fun yeah i'd be i definitely look forward to that it's nice catching some other than a large mouth sometimes <laughs> Yeah, I mean, largemouth, man, I don't know. Like, I if I had to pick, it'd probably be between the spots and the smallmouth, honestly. It's just, I just enjoy it more. Like, if you look right. at, like, punching in Florida, it's okay. It's just boring as hell, honestly. Like, to, in my, my mind, it's just boring as hell. But, yeah, you get up there, and you get the drag screaming type of deal and the jumping. That, it makes it, it makes it more enjoyable, honestly. Yeah, I agree with that. So, I mean, dude, I mean, I thank you so much for coming on the show today. I, I really appreciate it. I mean, is there anything else that, that we need to touch on that that's going to be happening for you? Um, no, I think that's about it. I'm just going to fish as many tournaments as possible and hopefully still have some success the rest of the year. <laughs> so I, I always ask this to people that are on the show is what, what are some of your goals in for this year? Cause it sounds like you've pretty much done everything. Is there any kind of goals in particular that you have this year that you haven't like checked off? Mm, not really. I mean, I guess an obvious goal would be to, uh, I love to win that two day Angler's Choice tournament because I've, that's honestly the one tournament I've never won is a, I've never won an Angler's Choice tournament. And that's going to be a fun, fun trophy room. <laughs> Yeah, I would love to have that one because they actually got like a, you know, some trails. I mean, not hating on them, but like the trophies aren't that impressive. But Angler's Choice has a pretty one, and I ain't, and I haven't been able to get my hands on it. <laughs> you know what? Thank you though for saying that because that's like in some of like I'm also part of this local kayak club too, and that's something I was like, you know what? It's kind of cool to have the trophies again. I missed that. Like I'm not saying yeah, I like the cash, but damn it, sometimes when you win, it's it, nice to have something to put on your mantle. Well, the, the cash is excellent, but like having a pretty trophy to remember the cash with is even better. <laughs> what trophy has the best memory for you? There's got to well, be a story. It's maybe two of them. Probably one the, uh, the in 2020 when I was able to win the Ket Championship. I think that had 200 and some boats in it with my dad. I oh, mean, cool. that was special because, I mean, we beat the best of the best, and I couldn't think of anybody else that I'd rather do it with than my dad. And then secondly was probably the regional win at Lake Mary just because a lot of people ragged on me for a long time saying I could only catch fish at Bugs Island, and then I made it down there and won that, and I was like, thank you all. <laughs> that one is big. I think for you, for any angler mentally is we all like, so I think there's, there's two moments. And, and one of them is when you get your first win and you realize you can do this because before Absolutely. that, my voice is telling you like, you suck, you suck, you suck. The second <laughs> is I'm just a river rat or I'm just a, this guy and you can't catch him outside of there. Is it, that moment, is that when you started to think about like going to the next level once you had that Lake Murray or where were you mentally after that win? I'd already that I'd already thought been thinking about it, but that definitely just added some extra confidence that you could go other places and catch them, especially with it being in the fall, which makes it a little tougher. And because you know, it was early October and the lake had got like in practice, you could probably see ten foot down, but when the actual tournament, the lake had got that brown look to it because it was trying to turn over, <laughs> so that made it even more miserable. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I wonder why sometimes they put the schedule when they do for some of these things. Cause it really doesn't show off some places like it could. If it had been two weeks earlier or like right before the cutoff, it probably would have took anywhere from 20 to 25 a day. Damn. It, it was pretty unbelievable the way it was fishing, which I honestly think the toughness helped me because I'm used to, bugs island and it don't get much tougher than that in september and october <laughs> do you think bugs is that the, the hardest time of year to actually go there and have fun i'm just saying not even a tournament standpoint just to go there is it is it september because that's that's where you hear the doc talk uh i'd honestly give it july and august september like you can still catch a lot of numbers in my opinion but it's just a lot of them low two pounders or high one pounders but July, it can get pretty brutal for whatever reason. Hmm. That is weird. That, that lake is so freaking weird. 
I can't wait to get some biologists on the show too, to kind of like talk about that, what's going on there. Cause I, I would love yeah. to see that place drop 30 pounds in the future. Oh yeah. The only time it like truly puts out some December, January and February when there ain't really any tournaments to fish. I wish they like put one big tournament during that stretch. I think that would kind of show it off because it's still, it still ain't that impressive, but you could definitely have some 20 pound bags. Yeah. And that was the thing I was, I was, it was sad when, when the Bassmasters went there to show it off and it was like, ugh. You know, mm-hmm. the time of year, every all the conditions, and we were betting like no one's gonna catch twenty pounds. It's gonna take thirteen to get, and it's like what thirteen a day got you in the top ten. I think it was like oh my it was, god, yep. And it's just like if they came a little bit earlier or a little bit later, maybe it, it would have really helped that place out. Yep. Which for whatever reason, the whole spring it kind of been off this year. Like a year before, it was on fire. Well, on fire for bugs anyways i think it it's almost like it warmed up too quick but then it didn't even get warm it just it warmed up enough to mess like the good march bite up but it didn't get warm enough to accomplish anything (laughs) is it brought the fish up up shallow but i don't know like the weights went down for whatever reason it was weird like the water temperatures have been funky the grass beds haven't been coming in in certain places like they usually are up up where i am um, like the only tournament that really showed out, I think it was, it was either the, I think it was the Shenandoah division on the Smith mountain Lake where they all pulled up to spawn. Like that was the time where they oh, hit yeah. it. Like, right. Like that yeah, place really showed. Them. Oh my God, dude. That thing was insane. I I was fishing something else that week. I, w- I wanted to fish that one. I know I probably wouldn't have had a chance of winning, but you still had a chance at a good bag because everybody killed them in that one. Well, and that's what I mean. It's like, I've, I've talked to my friends about fun. Like I had a tournament on the upper bay and I was like, this sucks. I hate my life. I don't want to be here. Like <laughs> half the field doesn't catch shit, but a striper and a flounder. And then one guy catches 20 pounds. Like this is terrible. Like I'd rather right. be somewhere. It's like, I suck, but I, I stuck a six and a half on a bed. Like, all right. <laughs> this is still a fun weekend. Yeah. For sure. But dude, no, again, like I can't, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, is there any uh, sponsors or anyone that we could, we can promote? Oh, uh, just give a shout out to Twin Lakes Marine and uh, in Henderson, North Carolina and Missile Baits. Again, guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. I'll also uh, put Tyler Trent's social media plugs there so you can actually go support him and help him out. So if next year we see him on the big circuit, you know, we can help push him up there into the the the, uh, the big leagues. Dude, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Like and subscribe to the channel, guys, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will